Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. Say no. It's not like you're the only actor in the world and they're only going to you. They're going to be going to other people. And the same way with if you audition for something that you want and you get told no, like the universe's rejection is the universe's redirection for something better. Hello, devoted podcast listeners. Uh, do we have a great show for you today? First things first, our guest today is Eva Noblezada, who Broadway audiences certainly know from Miss Saigon and from Hades Town. She's been nominated for the Tony Award. She's a legend. She has one of the most beautiful singing voices in the entire world. And so it was a treat to get her on the podcast to talk about um, certainly finding fame at a young age or rather um, the childhood dream of becoming a theater superstar and then having that very suddenly realized, as she talks about with her kind of big breakout through her performance at the Jimmy Awards in 2013 when she was only 17 years old. It's been a whirlwind of a seven years, as she said. Everyone has a different, you know, path in this industry. And I think this interview kind of sheds light on not just one person's maybe extraordinary path, But for those who are at the maybe at the beginning of their career and certainly teenagers who are interested in in theater or just performing or just the arts in general, whether that's, you know, a creator or an actor, Eva has very specific, very helpful, very practical insights into how to navigate social media, how to navigate attention, how to harness your inner voice and think about your flaws and your trauma and use those to help you grow as a person how that informs you as an artist, as a professional, and also just as a person. It keeps coming back to how to take care of yourself as a person with Eva. She's so frank about this stuff. She's documented it on social media. Um, She has this excellent new podcast called The Amarillo Project that I encourage you to listen to. Oh, and she's in this new film called Yellow Rose, which is actually out tomorrow, October 9. And Yellow Rose is the a story of an undocumented Filipina teen and her mother living in modern-day Texas. And so Eva plays the titular character Rose, who has this love for country music. There's these beautiful country songs. And um, just so you guys know, her co-stars in this movie are the country singer extraordinaire Dale Watson, and also musical theater legend Lea Salonga, who, of course, Eva has known for her whole whirlwind of a career because Lea Salonga is a groundbreaking Asian performer on Broadway. She's the first Asian woman to receive a Tony Award, etc., etc. They both played Kim in Miss Saigon and Eponine in Les Mis. So it was sort of a full circle moment. Please check out Yellow Rose. It's beautiful. But anyway, the other thing about this week's episode is that as you heard last week, our new backstage casting insider, Christine McKenna Torella, will be joining us every week after each interview or discussion to give you a rundown of whether it's practical advice from her experience on both sides of the casting table, how it links up to backstage, backstage casting, the product, backstage casting updates. She will be mentioning each week a couple current casting notices for those of you who are interested in working. Yes, in 2020, there are still jobs. There are still gigs being booked on Backstage.com. Christine is there to outline those for you. Um, And this is College Guide Week. It's actually sort of amazing. We booked Eva this week and got to ask her about her attitude towards colleges and education in general, because she certainly has her opinions on the matter, especially when it comes to the basic question of, do you want to go? Whether or not you should go to college. Christine weighs in on that as well in her segment after this interview, so please stick around. It is College Guide Week, so in today's episode description and um, in the article for today's episode, I will be linking to Backstage's education page, as well as a new feature highlighting top drama schools. 
taking a look at Backstage Magazine this week. First of all, the fabulous Janelle Monae is on our cover, but we also have interviews with a movement instructor from Juilliard, a talk about casting with the USC School of Dramatic Arts Admissions Department, and that feature I mentioned. This is this week's Backstage Magazine, whether you're getting it in print or online, is catered towards teenagers or those looking to go to college and looking to reconcile their passion for the arts, their passion for acting with education. It's a little overwhelming. There's there's a lot of options. It's a lot to consider. But please check out this week's Backstage, which is, which is an excellent guide to those things. Stick around after this interview to hear from Christine, because she is providing an excellent guide to those things going forward. And uh, without further ado, let's get to it. First, with a quick word from this week's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by the UNC School of the Arts critically acclaimed School of Drama. Ranked number six in the nation by The Hollywood Reporter, it has produced versatile, successful actors including Jonathan Majors, Elizabeth Lale, and Dane DeHaan. Rigorous coursework is coupled with intensive production training to develop actors ready to compete at the highest level in today's demanding professional environment. Apply today at uncsa.edu slash drama. Eva Noblezada went from high schooler to superstar practically overnight. Her performance at the 2013 National High School Musical Theater Awards, aka the Jimmies, earned her the lead role in the West End then Broadway revival of Miss Saigon. Eva received leading musical actress Tony nominations for both Miss Saigon and her second Broadway appearance, last year's Hades Town. She now stars and sings in the hit indie film Yellow Rose from Diane Paragas. Here is our candid chat with Eva Noblezada. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm okay. How are you? Doing okay. Um, I was just rereading. You and I sat down for a phone interview in 2017 when you were returning to Broadway in Miss Saigon. Mm, Jesus. Yeah, which feels like decades, not years ago. It feels mm-hmm. like a really long time ago. But um, you have an entire podcast dedicated to, that you just launched to dedicated to self care in 2020. But I got to ask, you know, how are you? How are you holding up? And what are you doing to to cope and to manage? I can't complain. I have a roof over my head, food, alcohol, my partner, mm-hmm. Wi Fi. I can't complain. Um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of just like honestly living my life. As I mean, like, it's not like I'm not just going out and like going out in the city and like mask off, like, like, you know, running down the streets. I'm bridled. I'm just saying like a lot of just time spent doing whatever I want to do, which I haven't had the opportunity to do that literally in seven years. So sure. But on, I have say like the podcast is a great like thing for me to like hunker down and focus on and watching TV. Oh, my God. Reading, reading so many good books. <laughs> And just like, I'm pole dancing as well. I've been doing that. And it's like my new love. That's great. Yeah, it's my new love. love We just featured Nicole Byer on this podcast. And she is similarly, uh, she says that that's her one real outlet, pole dancing. Yeah, totally. At this point, I got to get into it. At this point, it's just calling my name too. Yeah, at this point, it's just like, why have you not? (laughs) Why have, yeah. It would probably be therapeutic for us all, all, everyone. So funny you say, of course, I want to ask you about your, this is Backstage's podcast and we love asking about, you know, people's beginnings, their inspirations, their, their journeys through the biz for the biz. And it's so interesting. You say you haven't had a break in seven years because (laughs) it certainly seems that way. Um, For those who do, who may not know our listeners who don't know your, I mean, I think of it as a pretty extraordinary, like big break. I don't know if we want to call it a big break, but of course. Explain maybe a little bit about the Jimmy Awards and how that kind of launched your <laughs> launched your career. Yeah, the Jimmy Awards, um, um, otherwise known as the National High School Musical Theater Awards, it's mm-hmm. this incredible two or a week and a half program that really showcases young talent in America. Um, and you get two contestants from each state that fly to New York and compete in this amazing musical theater competition and. You get to work with Broadway stars. You get to work with acclaimed actors and singers and directors mm. and choreographers. And at the end of the week, after your training, you put on this production in front of family and friends and casting directors and New Yorkers and make your Broadway stage debut. It's, it's a truly magical week. And 
I participated in 2013 and there is a beautiful woman in the audience named Tara Rubin. <laughs> and she actually happened to be longtime friends with my theater teacher and oh, okay. they helped me, I guess, get my first audition for Miss Saigon. And she was like, you have to audition for Miss Saigon. And I was like, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> so it was actually, it was crazy. Yeah. Totally a big break. Absolutely. Kind of situation. And you were seven, 16 and 17 at this, around then? I was 17. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was 17. And left to go to the West End, essentially. Yes, left, I did. Uh, North Carolina. Bye, yeah. NC. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> and was that, so how, how does that compare to like the goal? Like what was the childhood dream? Childhood dream was to be a Broadway star. Okay. And so it was the best five-year detour <laughs> I <laughs> right. could have ever asked for, for sure. Amazing. Right. That's amazing. Um, obviously, we on this podcast, we actually really love hearing about the youth. <laughs> the youth. <laughs> and just like <laughs> young people. And you are such a case study of um, that kind of whirlwind of success that can, that can happen in this industry unlike any other industry. Totally. And you came out I would say relatively unscathed considering you were <laughs> such a young age. Nope. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Everyone's like, how are you so mature for your age? I'm just like trauma, bit, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> right. seriously, that's, it's just like, that's like my whole existence when it comes to like being on social media is to talk about yes. all the crap that they don't talk to you about. They don't warn anybody, um, yeah. what they're pushing you into. And like, I don't, I don't understand why people don't talk about it because it leaves people you know, I would love to send certain people my therapy bill over the past five, six years. Totally. I would love to do that. Sure. But, you know, I'm bigger. I'm bigger than that. I have a, <laughs> I have more self-control and also I don't have their address or else I would. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> no, you're, um, you are setting, I think, an example of, because you're right, it's not the norm to share intimate detail, those, those kind of vulnerabilities that you tend to share. And yeah, over social media. Mm. So is it safe to say that maybe at 17, you wish you had had more examples of fame, of the industry, of that kind of whirlwind of success and how to navigate that? Um, it's hard to say because if I had given myself what I at the time needed, then I wouldn't have gone through the situations that taught me the harsh lessons of life earlier on. Mm. Um, so in a way, in a really twisted way, I'm extremely grateful for the trauma. I yeah. am. Um, I hear that. It's, it's been a long journey of, like I said before, um, therapy and spiritual awakening and losing friends and gaining toxic friends and mm. learning how to say no, which is a huge thing. But that's kind of why I, I like to have my presence be as authentic and raw and I guess like <laughs> unashamed as possible, because honestly, yeah. I just, I don't care about an image. Um, I think I think it's a waste of life. Mm. It's like how, like, I don't know. I just, I have a very strong opinion on like having an image. Like there's a, there's a way to be professional, respectful and still not lose yourself. And you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. I, I learned too much at a, in a small time. So. Yeah. And it's just, it's the, this, the fact of the matter is it's the industry that you work in is image obsessed or is um, it's required for you to think about how you come off to other people yeah. But your philosophy seems to be, it's coming from the inside out. I'm never trying to cater from the outside. I'm never trying to cater some image to get a part or to appease a certain Ugh. audience or <laughs> you're rolling your Do eyes. You, uh, right? I just can't. It makes me, it makes me sick. It's like, yeah. I mean, does your, does this podcast allow, I mean, I'm sure it's like, you're probably to try, try not to curse, but it's hard to Go talk about it. this. Okay. That's very kind. Um, I do think it's bullshit because mm -hmm. honestly, when I'm cast in something, I'm not cast as Eva. I'm cast as what I can do, what my work ethic is yeah. and what my talents provide, not who I am. Right. And that's why you have just like, I, that's why I guess what I'm trying to say is I wish what young people are, ha are being taught when they're in school is that I have the my, my big three issues with like whatever, and I didn't have the chance to go to college, so I understand that my opinion is a little far away. But this whole uh, theory of like being so technically perfect in three things, like being the triple threat, huh. it's like you're making these students give all of their passion, which they have a lot of, mm -hmm. to things that honestly, at the end of the day, are not important. 
they're not going to, they're not, someone's not going to see triple threat on their resume and hire them. Right. And if they decide to, what do they have left? What have you taught them about their sense of self and who they are as a person? Have you taught them that actually you're more important as the human when you wake up, not what you can do and not how high your leg goes? Because totally. at the end of the day, when they need, when they go to bed and when they go home from a long day at work, that's who they're left with. And if you take everything away from them, they have nothing. So it just, there's so many teachers that I'm hearing these students come and talk and when I teach and they're like, yeah, my teacher said that I'll only sing this. And I'm like, why are, why are people still teaching in this like stupid ass, small minded, limited way? It's, it's, it's deprecating Mm -hmm. for, for young people. And I say young people specifically because they, they would not be spending thousands of dollars hundreds of thousands of dollars on college if they weren't passionate about something, if they weren't hungry mm. to perform. So I feel like these schools just like rinse them of like raw mm. creativity. Like, what do you have left? So it just makes me sad. And I feel like that happened to me in a way. You know, I got to London and they said, you're too fat. You're too ugly. We're putting you on the pill. We're putting you on Yakutane. Oh. We're putting you on a diet. We're sending you to a personal trainer five times a week. And I got sick, man. I was sick. So... Wow. That's what I want people to to understand is like doing anything in life, co- there's there's consequence. So we have to learn how to find balance in our life. Totally. And every um, even though it is the the dream, as you say, it was your dream to do this, there's like there's a there's a cost. I mean, there's hard work with anything. Yeah. And the limits that the industry imposes on people, I think, is very real. As as you say, especially for young people, mm. especially for women. Mm-hmm. And maybe especially for for people of color. I mean, I don't know how much you want to go there, but I would also love to ask, like, what is what is your perceptions of you? You have experience on two sides of things, on the Broadway side of things and on yeah. the Hollywood side of things as a woman of color in an industry that, like most industries in America, the default tends to be an image of a straight white man or the decisions tend yeah. to be made by straight white men. Yeah. How have you found in these? What, what did you say? Seven years? The whirlwind of a seven years. Yeah. Is navigating that a big conscious part of the journey? Absolutely. And I think what you said before about the dream, if people really want to think about it, their dream isn't to be, I think, I guess I'm speaking for hopefully a lot of people, the dream isn't to be famous or to make it to Broadway. It's it's to right. continue to have the joy of doing what you love to do. Totally. And I say that, the yeah. joy. And a lot of people have their joy taken away from them because they say that's the price it takes. That's the price that's required for you to do eight shows a week and to have X amount of Instagram followers or like all yes. these different types of movie, uh, you know, situation things. So I would say for me, it is absolutely a conscious effort. It's a conscious effort for me to read something. I've learned, I've honed my skills of self-awareness to go, this goes against my gut. The answer is no. Saying awesome. no, not caring what people think, caring what specific people think, knowing who's on my team, being able to read someone's energy and say, I don't really want you around me. Let me learn how to put my barrier up. Learning how to sit down and work my ass off for something. Mm-hmm. Because even if my body's tired or my brain's tired, because I know that that's important for me to continue to develop that skill. There's just so many things that are a part of that. And I wish that people were teaching that more. That's, yeah, as you say, the more, if you can't, if you're not developing yourself as a person, then how are you going to develop as an actor? I mean, an actor can't just study being an actor. No. Because then they would only be able to play actors. <laughs> exactly. But it's also kind of like when you wake up in the morning and when you go to sleep, you're not an actor, you're a freaking human, human being. Right. And I try to teach my students that it's like, imagine like the tree, like a, a trunk of a really old, wise like Hmm. historical tree, the trunk's going to be thick and the branches are going to be thick and the, Hmm. the, the fruit or the flowers it produces leaves are going to be healthy and vibrant. And there's going to be many branches. And I'm like, wouldn't you rather have that sense of self that has a strong foundation like that rather than let me learn how to give all of myself to my technique or all of myself to like Hmm. getting the perfect agent or doing the perfect self tape. Like, wouldn't you rather be like a strong thing rather than like five different buds that's like you can't so i don't know it is it is you're right it's absolutely a conscious decision decisions being made constant decisions and as you say saying no i mean saying no is such a difficult 
skill, I think, especially again, for young people, for people who are vulnerable in the industry. And, and you're right that it's about building a strong enough foundation to then constantly, I don't know, do, doing the work of the self. It's almost like a, is it a, do you think of it ever as a professional versus personal? This is a, the professional Ooh, version of me, and this is the personal version of me. And they, they don't mix. And me in the audition room, I'm a professional. Yeah, I would say my trick is to always intertwine my personal and professional. Right. That okay. is my, I think that's my trick of how people have perceived me. And I'm very grateful to have had that inner voice that I listened to when I developed who I was in this category of performance on Broadway. Hmm. I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was authentic. I wanted to make, to make sure people knew that I worked very hard and that I did know how to say no. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the, I'm proud of myself for establishing that. Like, yes, I'm goofy. Yes. I have a foul mouth. Yes. I know I'm young and, but I'm also extremely wise and I work my ass off. Right. To me, that's the, that's the ultimate and ultimate. I'm not saying like, cast me. I'm saying, Right. It, it came with a. Uh, it came with really that horrible, just uh, uncomfortable, um, painful journey of learning who I was and what yeah. I actually wanted in my life, in my career. Totally. And as you say, as you said earlier, the trauma is what teaches you that. Right. It's the hard. Mm -hmm. It is the hard times that allow you to really know yourself. And you don't have to live there. That's what I want people to know. Like you don't have to just yeah. because you you had it like. I, absolutely. If I wanted to wake up and, and have a pity party or on the other extreme side of it, have an anxiety because something's happening, mm. I can choose to live there for days if I'm not yeah. rooting for myself. But if I, just, if I decide that like, hey, whoa, wake up, Eva. Why are we still sitting in the mud? Let's get up and let's move on. Like, it's con yeah. we're constantly in that 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 cycle. It's not like we stop and start, and it's not like we make bad decisions or good decisions. Right. It's just a constant cycle of of life and consciousness. So, and it, that's how I think of it as theater. Like getting the job is just as difficult as staying in the job. It's just as difficult as maintaining your personal life in the job. It's just as difficult as saying, you know what? No, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so it's just we have to re we have to be aware of the of the uh, cycles that we put ourselves into, but remembering mm. that at the end of the day, the thing that's keeping me running through all of these different circles in my life and cycles in my life is this, is Eva. It's, mm -hmm. my, it's this body, it's this mind, it's this heart. So if I can, I have to take care of myself. And I, I think that's why like this whole self-care thing is, is like blown up. And like, to me, it's sure. like, yeah, if you want to do a face mask, do a face mask. If you want to <laughs> like have a glass of wine, have a glass of wine, but you got to do the dirty work. You got to get your hands dirty and go in there and take out that crap in your yes. spirit that it's it's not serving you anymore. It's hard work. I need to hear it. It's really hard work. I, I, we all need to hear it. I think especially just this year where it just feels like an assault of 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 traumas. Like this year mm, has total put assault me personally to the test of like. I just love this idea that you keep coming back to. The, it is a decision. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that's what a lot of people, especially maybe young actors in the biz, don't necessarily understand yet is that mm. everything is a decision you can say no i mm -hmm. think that people are maybe taught you can't say no you have to absolutely how dare you say no you to right. a good opportunity how dare you don't be ungrateful how dare you don't say a million thousands of people would say yes how dare you say no yeah like a guilt trippy mm. from society kind of I, you said inner voice and you meant inner voice of you yourself but there's also oh, an God, inner voice yeah. of like society like the that voice that says you should do this or shouldn't do this. I would say the more aware I am of my inner voice, the more aware I know if the voice is an imposter. And Ooh, that to me, yeah. even if it's in internal and I hear it, I go, ah, no, F you. You're not, you're not me. <laughs> you're and it an sounds imposter. like you. Yeah. Like I, I like that idea of like, to, it's a skill to identify when that voice, when you can distance yourself from that voice. Absolutely. Because it's you, it's coming from inside of me, but I have to be like, no, no. No, no, you shush. You like, shush. I, yeah. I hear you and I'm moving on. That kind of thing. Yeah. I always, um, my, I said this, I think like a few weeks ago about you have to uh, establish your inner security guard of kind of like, Ooh. hold on, hold on. Who is this? Hey, <gasps> hey, hey, Eva. It's a, knock, it's like knock, a bouncer. Knock. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, are <laughs> we, uh, are we letting this in today? 
okay, the answer is no. Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> and you're saying sometimes the answer could be yes if if wallowing is on the on the menu and if you're in touch with yourself and like you said you want to be in the mud for a little bit you could sometimes you that. have sometimes you sure. have to be in the mud and I, I I'm not at all saying that not having an anxiety attack is a decision. It's not. I have those all the freaking time. I'll be walking right. down the street. I'll, I'll be in the shower or be coming out of the shower, or, you know, having something to eat. You know, it it it, yeah. it hits you at every, sometimes when you're completely unaware. That's, it's an assault. But the decision, even if it's a micro decision, it's like, I'm mm-hmm. going to cry. Should I, I don't know, put something comfortable on? Should I put some nice music on? Should I have a glass of water? Should mm-hmm. I, uh, call a friend? Should I sit and cry and let it all? Those are, I think it's important though, for everyone to know that I'm saying that there are always decisions for you. Mm -hmm. Like you can make magic in that moment. You can make a positive. And what I mean Mm -hmm. by that is like put making your body comfortable, giving yourself a little head massage, having a glass of water, a cup of tea. Like those are many decisions you can make to create positive. And it's Mm -hmm. an actual science. Just like people say, move your body when you're feeling down. It's an actual science of what happens to your body, the chemical imbalances that we have. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's like, we have to remind ourselves, young artists and also just artists of all ages have to remind, we have to remind ourselves that we are always in control. Tracy McMillan says that she goes, I can't control what happens, but I can control how I react in my circle. And that is everything to me. Mm Mm-hmm. I love that. Absolutely. What you're saying about that, that idea of like knowing what could work for self-care and, and asking those questions about, should I do this when I feel this, or should I do this and learning what works for you yourself in that moment, that yeah. is what you're saying is uh, the dirty work, right? Like that it's is dirty the, um, work. Yeah. And it's hard. Yeah. And it's not be. like, it's not like, you know, the second I figure out, wow, this really works for me. It doesn't mean that everything I did before was wrong or bad. Mm. It just means it's that's what I'm saying. It's a constant cycle. And I, I hate to sound actually, no, I love to sound witchy because I'm like half witch, but <laughs> it's just like the cycles of the moon. You know, when you set your intentions mm. with the, with the new moon and then you see how far you've come with your intentions for the full moon, it's kind of like you're constantly learning and relearning things about yourself. And even oh, yeah. if it's the same lesson over and over again, that's just life. Yes. That's just I think about that all the time. So the, the line between learning and relearning is very thin. Ooh. Yeah, We're always relearning absolutely. the same things, just in different ways and different contexts. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice. <laughs> but how do you how do you how do you learn self awareness? Practice, practice, practice. Exactly. Well, and yeah. way to, like way to tie it back to the career aspect because like I'm supposed to be asking you about your journey. I understand. I, I I was like, let me give you a theater reference because I have a podcast too, and I understand. Like, so exactly. this is crunch your time. <laughs> and the the self care stuff is so important for both the the personal, both the inner work. But also, as you say, practice, practice, practice to also get to Carnegie Hall. Like Mm -hmm. everything you're saying also applies to like audition prep. Right. And um, you have you have turned down roles and that involves that process of asking what works for me and what doesn't. Right. People like imagine if you said yes to everything and you got everything. How miserable would you be? You'd probably be horrible. That would be so disgusting, like (laughs) constantly working and not being happy. Like that's not the dream that you wanted when you were a child. The dream you wanted when you saw someone performing is you saw the joy, you felt the joy and you wanted to experience that joy as an adult. And maybe Mm -hmm. the dream in you as a child was knowing that a lot of adults are not happy in their nine to five. So the, the whole dream aspect of it, that dream as an out of reach is like, maybe I can perform and be joyful at, at like Mm. this age that most adults aren't happy. You know, like that's what I kind of thought as a child and looking now, like I feel like a 57 year old woman sometimes living in a 24 year old body. Same. Um, with an 85 year old liver, you know what, what can you do? (laughs) Sure. Liver of an Irish man. Uh, (laughs) but I just see the hunger. Like there's so much beautiful hunger and like wildness from these young students and i just want them to run like run and just find your own path it doesn't mean that college is it you know some people really want to go to college and it helps them some people don't want to go to college and guess what i did never wanted to go to college like the thought of it like kind of pissed me off you know Mm -hmm. i wanted to move to new york and like scrape by and like work my ass off and audition and you know just gotta Find your inner voice because it's always kind of whispering to you what you want to do. That's beautiful. 
This episode is brought to you by the UNC School of the Arts critically acclaimed School of Drama. Ranked number six in the nation by The Hollywood Reporter, it has produced versatile, successful actors including Jonathan Majors, Elizabeth Lale, and Dane DeHaan. Rigorous coursework is coupled with intensive production training to develop actors ready to compete at the highest level in today's demanding professional environment. Apply today at uncsa.edu slash drama. Speaking of your early inspirations, what were, I mean, what were the early inspirations that ignited that fire, that passion you're talking about for you? Ooh, movies. I, I mean, I, I, people always say like, how did you learn how to act? And it's like, it's so funny. It's like you read a book and you learn how to act. Um, <laughs> it's not how it works. Okay. <laughs> uh, but um, I always, you know, my inspirations, I think, honestly, Broadway wise were like, I loved Sutton Foster. I okay. loved her legs. I loved oh, her belt. Cool. I loved her presence. For me, she embodied joy on stage to me. So that's, that's beautiful. It was so nice to just watch her, but also like watching movies. My dad had made this like beautiful home cinema projector screen and hmm. I remember putting on my favorite films over and over again. I would play the scene, pause it and write the, the script down by hand and then oh, cool. yeah. memorize the script and like memorize each character regardless of sex and age. And yeah. It was just like, that was my acting lesson. And then I would That's go into cool. my room, read the monologue in my laptop, record a video and watch it back. That's so you, what I would oh, do. You would do also do the camera work and watch oh, yourself yeah. on camera. I would do the camera work and watch That's it back cool. and be like, oh, why is my face doing that? Oh, I need to like work on this. Even with uh -huh. my singing too. Singing into my laptop and recording the audio and then listening back and going, ooh, I was flat. Or like, ooh, can we sound, make it sound like this? Like I was constantly working because everyone you, you else was doing acting teacher. lessons. I was my own teacher. Right. I was my own teacher. And those are great tips. I mean, that's, that's great for anyone at any age. Record yourself either imitating or coming up with your own interpretation of a song or a scene. Absolutely. And but just being, it. being aware of your body and like what it does, like recording yourself is extremely helpful, especially in yeah. COVID times when a lot of the auditions will now be self tapes, self tapes, self tapes. We are backstage. We love hearing about self-tapes. Do you have advice? <laughs> <laughs> do you consider do. yourself a successful um, self-taper? Uh, it depends. If successful means I get every job, then absolutely f***ing not. Um, <laughs> so like, like, you're going to get, like, what? Like, It's funny. All the jobs that I've so far gotten in my career have been mm -hmm. offers or me. I literally asked Cameron McIntosh if I could be Eponine. And then the next week... Right. He was like, oh, come and sing the song. And I knew I had gotten the job. Like, I didn't even try and to you get were that. Seven, this was young. Yes, you were 17 or 18 when that happened. I was 19. I had done Saigon already for two years in London. And I literally yeah. asked Cameron at the oh, at the closing party, I said, well, can I do Epony next? And he was like, sure, darling. And then <sighs> I just, I, I sang it for him and I just got the role. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, that's amazing. But I would say for self-tapes, if you're in your home, which I'm pretty sure you are, who's not? Totally. Like, if you can, make your space, make your space a comfortable space. Mm -hmm. Because you have the, like, whenever I do a self-tape, I have, like, I put a few crystals out depending on, like, what I need. Have water. Oh, yeah. Honestly, some, most of the time, just a gin. Ooh, I feel like... <laughs> self-tape, perfect. Honestly, I don't even care anymore. I find that, like, the less stressed I am, the more authentic I can be. If I'm stressed, I have a limited um view of like what I can do that's great but advice. if I'm like if I like go in and I'm like I, even if I, I'm kind of playing a part though because I'll walk in into like myself self here and I'll be like yeah whatever let me just get this done and then like I'll do a really good job gotcha <laughs> so, so sort weird. of playing a, a character who is auditioning for for the thing yeah it's that's weird cool. it's such yeah, a yeah. mind game it is. And, and it's true that it's also a mind game, the idea of just setting up a, a comfortable environment. I think that's a really good tip because it goes back to what you're talking about of, of basic self-care. You yeah. know what works for you. So, I mean, use that to create your best work, right? Absolutely. Even if it's like, if, even if like, you know, when you're facing the camera behind it on the wall, if you have like pictures of your inspiration or like a really cool Ooh. piece of art that inspires you or like, light a freaking candle that you're like, oh, I love to smell. I love pumpkin spice. Like totally. whatever it can, whatever you can do to make yourself feel comfortable because we rarely get that opportunity when we're working with people in an actual environment. Like going into an audition room, hell no. Absolutely You don't get not. to light a candle there. <laughs> you don't. And that's against, it's fire regulation. It's fire <laughs> hazard. But <laughs> it's, it's also true. like, 
it's a scary environment because there are people, it's like a bad dream. You walk in, you see everyone else wearing Leducas and you're like, everyone's better than me. And then you walk mm. into the room and they're like, you know, it's cold and they're behind a table and they're like ready to judge you. Who wants yeah. that? It's, it's horrible. Kind of that, it's, it is. Yes. I mean, we, we at Backstage, we've heard every, I'm going to ask you, maybe I'll just ask you now. Do you have ask a worst me. audition horror story? I have two of them, but I'll, oh, okay. I'll choose, choose, oh, so you choose, ready to go. <laughs> choose A or choose A or B. Uh, let's go with A. Okay. That's a good one. Um, I, <laughs> honestly, all of my auditions are bad. I, I, my, even my Hades audition was bad. That was probably the worst audition I've ever, no, that's not true. This is the one I'm going to tell you is the worst audition I've ever had. <laughs> I was auditioning for a version of Oklahoma okay. and they had literally asked me in the thing to do like a jazzy version and i was like cool like um so i d- sang like uh what what song was it uh many a new day mm. and it was mm. i took it down the octave and like i was ma- I, I i remember like being oh this is so cool like i'm not a soprano but i get to bring in like my own version so i remember going into the audition room giving them the version that my pianist had written out for me a jazzy many a new day down the octave for for a trialto and then they said <laughs> I know we asked for jazzy, oh. but is there any way you could sing like in the, in the original key, like as it's, as it stands? And I was like, you have got to be kidding me. This is I day was of. like, day of in the audition. I was like, Ugh. I don't, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a soprano. I didn't practice that. I, I practiced what you asked me to do. Right. Um, and they're like, well, can you just try it? And obviously I was like, sure. Hmm. When I tell you I hadn't practiced it, like he was like, mm, bum, mm, I couldn't even hit the notes because oh, it was so a high. Different song, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, Many, mm, they, mm. and I was like laughing during it and like, <laughs> like, like making jokes during it and like making weird poses during it because it was so bad. And then the guy just goes like, keep going. And because the audition was so bad, they literally called me back in to audition for Ado Annie because they're like, oh, she was so funny, she was oh, so hilarious. Okay, rather than okay. <laughs> They're like, we need her in the character bit part. Yeah, exactly. I remember it being so bad that the second I left the casting office, I called my manager crying in the middle of Times Square. And I said, that audition alone, if that director and the people in the room have recorded that, that is the end of my career. It was oh, that bad. Wow. It was that I bad. mean, you're not a true actor until you've been crying in Times Square, I suppose. I actually completely <laughs> agree with that statement. <laughs> You're not, you don't yeah. know what, you don't know what the struggle is like until you've cried in Times Square. <laughs> and those are the, uh, what we're going back to this idea of like cultivating the inner voice and, and overcoming the struggles. Those are what teach you what works and what doesn't. Absolutely. Of course, in the audition room and in your career and what to say yes and no to all of that. It's the audition horror yeah. stories that teach you the most. If I had, if I could go back, I would have said, no, I'm not comfortable singing that because that wasn't on that's not what you asked me to prepare, but I'll be willing to go learn it on the piano. Right. In front of you. No, I, mm. if I could have done that instead, <laughs> but then I wouldn't have a good story. So what the hell? <laughs> well, that, that, that too. Yeah. Yeah. So talk true. to me about the, so the film aspect of this, obviously your gateway to the industry was through West End and Broadway. Mm-hmm. How did Yellow Rose come about? First of all. Yeah. Diane, our amazing, beautiful director, uh, saw me in Miss Saigon, the revival here in New York and um, got in touch with my management team and said, she's perfect for this film that I've been putting together over the last decade or so. Um, and so we met for sushi because that's what Asians do. Uh-huh. And uh, she just essentially gave me the script and didn't even ask. She was like, this is your, ro- your rose because she is Filipino and she grew up in Texas and she had that kind of upbringing so it was her story which was amazing and it was beautiful really uh, i was really honored for her to see me and go i want you to represent me that was really Mm -hmm. special to me that she had that trust and it's such a beautiful thing it really is beautiful and um the songs i could you explain so who wrote these songs and they're so beautifully suited for your voice and they're just amazing yeah um so it was dale watson um who wrote some of them and also diane wrote some of them um, so but cool. mainly Dale, yeah, who wrote these beautiful songs and we recorded all of them in his studio, which is so freaking cool. It's such a great story. I mean, it's it's the kind of story that going back to this idea of navigating Hollywood as a minority, I was just so struck by how there aren't enough films, there aren't enough stories about the, Im- the immigrant experience, about 
being detained. All the, I mean, that whole storyline was so gut wrenching and and obviously so based on real stuff. Yeah. That um, as you say, it has to be personal. Did you? I mean, did you feel like it was a real responsibility if you're telling a what semi autobiographical story from Diane's perspective? Absolutely, it was a huge responsibility because Filipinos are the third largest group of undocumented immigrants in the United States, and being half Mexican which is an, oh, wow. also the huge, like a huge, massive group of, yeah. so for me, it was like, it was completely personal because, you know, I mean, without getting whatever I know, I know people who are undocumented and live their life in fear because of the current administration and how his words validate racial prejudice and racial injustice and yeah. how his administration, you know, you know, didn't, uh, I mean, they said no to DACA. Like they didn't, they yeah. just pulled the plug on that. So I, I feel a responsibility just to know about what was happening when we were filming. So, mm. and it was a lot. Diane made sure that we were educated when it came to like all of that. Sure. And is that, is that also just general advice for actors um, or artists? They should be plugged into what's happening. I mean, they should be plugged into real issues because. If only because it, it informs the craft, right? It informs yeah. the work. I mean, I, I hate to be whatever, but I feel like actors who <laughs> actors who do their show or their performance without trying to dive in, hmm. I, don't know, I feel like that's very selfish. To, to, to be completely unaware of what's going on and just do it for attention, I think that's extremely selfish goes back to what you were saying about if you're getting into it for the fame rather than for the passion. Yeah. And then, you know, to each his own, if you're doing it for the pay, there are some gigs I go, I'm going to suck it up and do it for the paycheck because I want the freaking money. Who cares? Like I got to do it for the paycheck. But if I'm, if I'm doing a movie like Yellow Rose and I'm doing like, I'm not doing that for the paycheck. It's, it's a, it's a goddamn indie film. Like I'm not doing that for the paycheck. Um, I'm doing that because someone trusted me to be authentic and I have a responsibility but I know that most actors would also do the same thing in like research, you know, make sure they understand exactly the area that they're filming in. And the fact that, yes, mm. there were probably ice raids happening 30 miles down the road. Crazy. Um, right. So, yeah. That's amazing. And so I was going to say Yellow Rose is an obvious yes. And mm. I don't want to I don't want you to I'm not going to ask you to reveal like what a specific project that you said no to. But maybe in that early process of figuring out how to say no, that skill Mm -hmm. of how to say no, what goes through your mind when you're saying no? Like what it what are the what are the variables there that cause you to go, this is not for me? And Mm -hmm. are there doubts? Like are you also thinking, but maybe I should do this because paycheck, because et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would say I'm lucky that I can sing because that's an easy paycheck for me whenever I want it, whenever I want it. Um, it's easier for me to like I say yes to 95% of singing gigs. Um, the only hmm. other times is when they're like, do this for free. And I'm like, F you. Why would I sing for you for free? Right. Um, that's so stupid. Um, I do find it extremely disrespectful that people still ask artists to do things for free. But I would say acting wise, it's harder because hmm. you want the challenge, but you also want to do something that is going to be not worth your time, but worth the work. If that makes sense. So sure. I have certain just like types of acting projects or like roles that I don't want to do. Like, I don't like doing anything Disney when it comes to like okay. being a princess or like being uh, censored or. Interesting. I don't like doing anything. Yeah, I would say princessy. I just don't. Princessy, because that is a genre. I also do think that from a, if I were a casting director, I would be tempted to send you in for princess. Absolutely, stuff. and guess what? I have been sent in, and I realize <laughs> why am I have I said yes to this? This annoys me. Mm. Things that things that are like it, sometimes you read the script, and you're like, nah, this writing is amazing, but it's not for me. Uh huh. Or you read the script and you watch what the character, you know, how the character acts and responds, and you know that there's no leeway for change, and you go, mm. nah, this isn't for me. They're, they're obvious signs. They're obvious red flags. I mean, that mm. it's too extreme, but they're obvious signs of like, nah, no thanks. <laughs> sure. Sure. And of those, I mean, are there sometimes also like, are there examples of uh, maybe not outright sexism or racism, but the kinds of uh, red flags that are like, 
this was not written by someone who could speak authentically to oh, a yeah. certain um, maybe minority experience. Absolutely. I would say the one thing that pops in my head, which I'm not sure is a minority experience because you hmm. see it everywhere, is things that are like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, over-sexualized. Like, yeah. why, why, do, why is nudity required? Hmm. Why is nudity required? Like, is this gonna, yeah. is this yes. gonna, is that gonna help the storyline? Is it, is it like a huge reflection on who the character is? Is it an important part of the plot or something that's important for the, the something in the, towards the end of the film or the project? Most of yeah. the time, the answer is no. Yeah. And then you say, I don't really want to work with a team who tries to justify something that's right. inauthentic. So for me, that's an easy no. Mm. Easy no. Because then it begs the question, where is that impulse coming from and what are the real intentions there? Exactly. And also, if I said yes to the project, would I feel like I'm in a safe environment who are they actually looking out for my best interest rather okay. than we just want nudity? So like, you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Right, right, right. And it, I mean, it always sounds cheesy to say this, but it's all in, it should all be in service to a story, right? Like it should, Absolutely. the goal is to, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, art is subjective, but that's the thing. If you're just doing nudity for nudity, that's not art. That's just somebody who has a fat wallet and is in charge of, you know, something that's, they're not an artist. They're just trying yeah. to get people to watch and that's, you know, the more that you're aware of what you like to do as an artist, what inspires you and what drives your passion, the more right. that you can just see, you can see a fake project a mile away. Gotcha. Yeah. So it comes back to cultivating that inner voice because it allows yeah. you to identify bullshit, maybe? <laughs> mm-hmm. Abs no, absolutely. You put it perfectly. You just get to, you, you read something, you get the feel of something and you speak to someone and you go, that's not for me. It's a no for me, dog. It's a, no, it's a no for me, love. Yeah. yeah Cause sometimes it, and it's not necessarily a no for everyone. It's just that yeah, it's, it's just, about knowing what matches the outside versus the inside. And if it doesn't match. And look, say no, it's not like you're the only actor in the world and they're only going to you. They're going to be going to other people. And the same way with, if you audition for something that you want and you get told no, like the universe's rejection is the universe's redirection for something better. Hmm. I genuinely believe that. So that's why saying no to me is not a big deal. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste their time. There's right. something out there for me. I just have to be patient. I think it's such a good point. It's such a good piece of advice, especially again for early, early career artists to hear like the power of saying no. And it is ultimately a decision. It is. Absolutely. And it doesn't always seem that way in the life of an artist, but it is. Um, can I ask you some very, uh, two very silly backstage questions quick before Absolutely. we leave? Absolutely. What is one performance you think every actor should see and why? Ooh. You mentioned Sutton Foster was an early um, inspiration, some of those movies. Yeah, I would say, I'm just going to say Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight. Heath Ledger in anything. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Excellent. And of course, we um, we covered your worst audition horror story. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what is the one piece of advice that you would give? Maybe this this um, you competing in the Jimmy Awards. You know, you of seven years ago. Would you go back and give that that version of you any advice? Oh hell no! Advice is <laughs> I didn't so, think so. <laughs> advice is so objective. It's like yeah, uh, people take advice if they really need it, and a lot of the time they don't think they don't want it, which is two different things. If that makes sense. So there's oh. no way that I would, I could go back in time and tell my 17 year old self, Hey, try to do this. Like, I'm not going to listen. I'm too busy. That that's, that was a storyline that needed to happen to me. Like, no, I can't go back and change anything. And I wouldn't want to I think the only thing I would say is like, please don't dip dye your hair. It looks horrible. Don't do it. Stop <laughs> doing your eyebrows like that. It looks horrible. <laughs> Other than that, I would, that's the only thing I would say. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, tangible advice. Yeah. Thank you. I think our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you guys so much for having me. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. 
Jack, I love the conversation this week with Eva, especially the emphasis that she was placing on trusting her inner voice and intuition as an artist. I think that's so important as we start on our journey as actors and creators, either side of the casting table. And with that in mind, um, I had prepared a few things, a few tips about um, how to use our college guide. We have our college guide out this week. It's re a really fantastic resource if you're researching further education for acting, musical theatre, production or film. But of course, picking the course that is right for you will be unique to you. No two students are exactly the same. So here are my top tips uh, to get you started, to get you on the journey um, before you even open up our magazine this week. First of all, I recommend sitting down and writing a list of goals for your career. Your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, where do you think you want to start your career? LA, New York, Atlanta, Chicago. Those are just the United States options for you. What are your strengths as an artist? How do you want to develop those and work on them? Lean into some of the weaknesses, really um, celebrate the strengths you already have. You know, Eva's one of those artists that really knows who she is as a person. And I think that that's a really interesting and essential part of how we go about developing ourselves. A few other things that I think are really important. What type of campus experience is most appealing to you? Do you want to live in the cities that maybe you want to start building your careers in like LA or New York? Research the course options. There's so many different types of courses out there. And if you're going for a, a four-year university course, such as a, a BFA or an MA, what could you minor in? I think um, a huge takeaway from this crazy unexpected year so far is that having a diverse portfolio of skills that cover the array of creative possibilities could be incredibly useful as we move forward into new innovative spaces in the creative world. If you're looking into acting, dance, musical theater, i.e. something that's performance-based, do you get a showcase upon graduation? This is a big consideration because a showcase in, in New York or LA generally means that agents and managers and casting directors are invited by the school to come meet you and see some of your work before you graduate. And although it's not the be all and end all, it's a strong way to introduce yourself to the professional community. Finally, take a look at the alumni. How active is the alumni in your chosen city? Are there strong networking opportunities here? The business is about connecting with people and a strong alumni in your chosen area could be very useful in getting you started in your career. I hope that some of these points have been helpful. It's by no means exhaustive. Again, no two students are the same, but I wish you the best of luck in your selection process and your audition process for the colleges that we have featured in the amazing College Guide. All right, and while you're on the site looking at the College Guide, we have a few really exciting listings I want to talk to you about. So uh, I thought I'd start with a theater project because uh, our guest this week was Eva. And of course, she is known for her amazing theater projects. So uh, take a look at the Utah Shakespeare Festival. They are looking for video submissions for their 2021 season that just came um, onto the site on October 5th. So take a look. They are looking for new actors for their upcoming season for next year. A really cool commercial from UPS. They're looking for diverse faces to represent their international brand. It pays really well. <laughs> so take a look at that one. Um, the, the particular specs on that commercial, again, is on backstage. If you are currently pregnant <laughs> and an artist, there's a really cool project on a reality project that we have that features Courtney Cox on Facebook Watch, and they are looking for um, women on fertility journeys. So take a look at that if that's something that interests you, or perhaps you know someone else that might be interested in that casting call. 
Finally, for our creators out there, I haven't forgotten you. We have Sound Stories, a narrative contest that Backstage is running right now. We're accepting submissions until October 25th. The idea is you create a narrative project using only sound. It's a competition that has $5,000 worth of prizes. And I think most importantly, the judging panel is really amazing, right? We've got people from Tribeca Film Festival, the Society of Voice Arts and Sciences, Tongo, Music Bed, and Sundance Collab. Like, I would love those people to be seeing my, my project and my talent. So again, take a look at it. It is on the Backstage website. It is Sign Stories. And we are taking submissions until October 25th. I will be back next week with casting calls and casting tips. Until then, it has been my pleasure. Have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Browse Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.